you for being faithful. Thank you for Sunday school this morning to remind us that you are faithful even when we're not. And God, would you please transform us to be more faithful to you and help us to live by faith. Teach us what that means. And God, have mercy on anyone that doesn't know you. Have mercy, God, that they would make the right decisions, whatever they want. And God, that they would have a chance to meet you. In your name, amen. We're meditating on a broken heart. A broken heart. So a heart that's broken doesn't work right. It's broken. A heart that's broken tends to uh, not love freely. You're gun shy. You got trust issues. A heart that's broken doesn't tend to want to be loved very easily. It's hard. It's hardened. It's broken. It doesn't work right. And so just living with a broken heart isn't what God wants. But all of us have either experienced a broken heart or in the middle of a broken heart right now or will experience a broken heart. It is part of the world we live in. So I want to meditate on that briefly today. We're going to read Psalms 34. This is a good psalm to read when you have a broken heart. And I think all of us, to some degree, should keep our hearts broken and covered by the blood of Christ. Humble, humility, and understand that our pain is for His glory. Our pain is for His good for us. Everything that He does is good for us. And if we can understand that. I'm going to read this. It's quite long, so bear with me. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak of his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. It's humility, you see? It's all about Christ. Let all who are helpless take heart. Are you helpless today? I am. Take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me, and he freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. Wow. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. That's the if, eh? That's the if. All who fear him. Fearing him means I trust in him. I have faith in him. I know he's alive. I'm talking to him. I've invited him into my heart. All who fear him. That's the, the, the promise. If you don't fear him, that's not a promise. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. You want joy? Joy is deeper than happiness. It just doesn't come and go. Joy is consistent. Whatever your circumstances are. Happiness depends on your circumstances. Fear the Lord, you his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. There's that fearing the Lord, respecting the Lord, honoring the Lord. I used to fear my dad. I'm, he meant the world to me. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't running away from him. But when he said something, I listened. And I feared him with respect. Even strong lions sometimes go hungry. Even strong Christians mess up. But those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a, long, a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. We heard that on uh, Matthew 26. 1226, I think. I might not have that right. Um, don't let evil overcome you, but overcome evil by doing good. Here it is again. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. We are so busy searching for something to turn us on, something to make us happy, something to make us feel better. But here we have it. What you really want is peace. And if you can't have peace with your maker, you can't have peace with anyone else. 
What you want is that feeling of contentment, that feeling of I'm okay, that feeling that God's in control. Not more than a feeling, that faith that, that I am in his hands and he knows what he's doing no matter what's going on around me, no matter what I'm going. It's peace. That's why um, peace only comes from focusing on God. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Is your spirit crushed? The Lord is close to you today. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to rescue each time. Let's be careful here. It's not that I'm righteous and those guys are all bad. It's that I have Christ and he has made me righteous. It's a free gift that he gave me. And he is transforming me. It's not that I'm good and the rest of the world's bad. No, we're all bad. The Bible does not say there is, you gotta be good and you shouldn't be bad. The Bible says we're all bad and he is good. So be careful then, because when we go to heaven, we're all going to be shocked. We're all going to be shocked who is actually righteous and who isn't. There are going to be drug addicts that are in heaven because they cried out to Jesus. It might have been while they were overdosing. I don't know. We are going to be shocked. And there are people that went to church for 70 years that aren't righteous because they never cried out to Jesus. They never meant it. So be careful. It's not about... We're the good guys, so God is on our side. What God is saying is, if you accept me, if you believe in me, if you have faith in me, I will give you all of this. Protection, peace, joy, love, faith. I will give it to you. Righteousness, eternal life. Eternal life isn't living forever. We all live forever. You either live in hell forever or heaven forever. Eternal life is joy, peace, purpose. And most people don't have it. Most people don't have it. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. That is a prophecy about Jesus. Just so you know, Matthew brings it out in the book of Matthew. Jesus never had one bone broken. And this is where that comes from. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. That automatically says everyone who does not take refuge in him will be condemned. Will be condemned. How do you mend the broken heart part two? What not to do? What not to do? Now, this is an important verse right here. Deuteronomy 8, 19. What does this have to do with a broken heart? What not to do when you have a broken heart? And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. What does perish mean? Your heart stops? No. Keep this in line with eternity, with God. God does not see your death. My dad is not dead right now. He's not dead. He's with my mom, my sister, Moses. I don't know what he's doing. He's probably having a weightlifting contest with Samson right now. I, I don't know. But I know he's not dead. Your spirit lives on. I used to work at a funeral home. I've said this before. I never went to one funeral where they didn't say, oh, he's in a better place. She's in a better place. Everyone, atheists, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, First Nations, doesn't matter. Everyone wants to believe that there's something more than this because there is something more than this. And I will remind you, if you don't want to go to heaven, you have to be perfect. That's why it's heaven. All you have to do is obey every law greater than what the Pharisees obey. That's what Jesus said. All you got to do is be perfect. And nobody's perfect. That's why you have to humble yourself. And Jesus will make you perfect with his righteousness. You have to admit you're not perfect. You have to admit that you're a sinner. And you have to accept the free gift that he's given you. 
we always run to other gods. Now I know that we see this, Isaiah talks about this, we've been going through Isaiah, uh, you know, you build an idol with wood, and then you cook some wieners over the leftover wood, and then you bow down and start worshiping the, the wooden idol that you made from the same wood. How ridiculous is that? But we do it. We go to TV, because it comforts us. We go to websites that we shouldn't, because it makes us feel less lonely for a second or two. We go to bottles, we go to drugs, we go to people. We go to church. If you're coming to church to, to, to feel better about yourself, you're, you're, you're not, it's not gonna last. Somebody's gonna hurt you. Somebody's gonna let you down, probably me. Somebody's gonna let you down. If you're coming to church to discover Jesus, to discover God, he'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. He'll never stab you in the back. He'll never talk behind your back. He'll never gossip about you. He'll never leave you. He'll never give up on you. All the rest of us will let you down. Beware. Forgive. Please forgive. It's, you know you're growing in the Lord when you can forgive. You know you're getting closer to Him when you can forgive. If you forget the Lord your God, if you don't run to Him, and you run to other things, <laughs> Other gods, put it in that context. What are the idols in your life? Because we all have them. All of us have them, every one of us. And serve them and worship them. I remember, you know, I'm not a, knocking anybody down. You know, Lair, I know you smoke. Hey, it's okay, right? I know you're, 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 you're thinking I'm going to quit. That's between you and God. But I remember that every time I was stressed on the rigs, I would go have a smoke. And for some reason, the nicotine, and hey, I'm not judging anybody, please. I'm just giving you an example in my own life. Some reason, I thought the nicotine made me less stressed. <laughs> some of you guys that want to go for a smoke right now just because I'm talking about it, I know. You know, he's stressing me out, I gotta go have a smoke. You know, it isn't, think about it. Does, does that actually solve your problem? No, they can't. Yeah, they came back. Now, I also know that I had a very broken heart. I never drank before in my life. And I was 27 years old. I had a very broken heart. Something traumatic happened in my life. And I went to a liquor store for the first time. And I drank. I remember the first day. I remember it. I drank a bottle of Baby Duck. I drank a bottle of Southern Comfort. I drank about 15 draft beer. I was so pathetic, I had, you know, this bucket full of quarters, and I would count them out, and the bartender would give me another one, you know. I never been drank before, and I was sick for days. And then I stayed basically that way for 30 years. Did that help me? You know, I remember saying to people, it's the best I can do. Because at least with alcohol, it's instant. It's like, it's like with drugs or alcohol, it's like I, I immediately numb myself. And we're gonna talk about that. And it didn't hurt. But then I wake up and what happens? It's still there. It's worse even. <laughs> it's worse. I wake up and it's worse and I'm another $50 broker. And a big headache. And a big headache. And my liver's hurting. My, my health is hurting. I could have bought three houses with the money from pot and booze. I worked it out one time. You know, it was over a thousand dollars a month, most months. You know, just financially, just financially, not, not alone health, but spiritually, I'm running to other gods. I'm running to other gods. Do not numb yourself. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Perish means you will be divided from God. You will be divided from peace. You'll be divided from life. Death in the Bible is you don't have Jesus, I'm sorry. And people that don't have Jesus think I'm a nutball. You know, I'm talking about a ghost. I'm talking about a myth. I'm talking about some story. Don't, I don't care what you say. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. Amen. Every moment of every day. It was so great. I'm, I shouldn't mention his name. There was a, a youth. I'm so proud of him. He goes, Pastor Carson, when's the last time Jesus spoke to you? I says, well, he speaks to me all the time. How, wh why? Why do you ask that? Because he just spoke to me right now. 
Well, what did he say? I prayed that, you know, such and such would be there and he would meet you and he'd be in the right frame of mind and, and he, he, did, he answered my prayer. This is a little kid. This is a little kid that knows Jesus. Knows him personally. And what does it mean when you know Jesus? You know God. Jesus is God. There is only one way to God. If you can't get rid of the sin in your life, and you try that yourself, good luck, good luck. It ain't going to happen. Religion is all about trying to get rid of the sin in your life. You know, some guys think, well, you got to wear a fancy hat because that's going to help you get rid of the sin in your life, right? Because you are a foot and a half closer to God that way, right? Some people think you got to wear a robe. Some people think you got to have a beard. There are religions that think that you got to have a beard. Or, or maybe you got to give rice to your dead relatives once a year. And fruit and incense. Think about it. Think about it logically. There's only one way. God gives it to you. God gives it to you. God gives you life. You have to do what with the gift? You got you to gotta open it. You got to accept it. That's all you need to do. Martin Luther was once asked, what do you have to do to be saved? What do you bring to God to be saved? He says, your sin and your stubborn heart. That's the only two things you can bring. Your sin and your stubborn heart. So God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. What is he saying here? A lot of people say, you can't serve anybody else. It's me, 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 me. Why is he like that? Why is he jealous? Because you're going to die if you don't serve anybody else. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be brokenhearted forever. You're going to have baggage on your back forever till the day you die. And when you die, if you don't accept him, you're going to go to hell forever. And it's going to be like that forever. You're going to be separated from God forever. That's hell. I don't know. Are you fire or torture? I don't know. What I do know is those emotional times in your life when you're all alone and you're isolated and you're, you're angry and you're bitter and you're alone and you're afraid. Multiply it by thousands and thousands and thousands and that's hell. And we've all tasted that. So he is not jealous because he wants you to be, he's the king. You know, he's, he's got an ego problem. He's, he's your father. He wants you to live. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you an abundant life. Any, another human being will never have the ability to make you whole. Stop looking for girlfriends, some of you single guys. <laughs> you know, get your own life straight first. Stop looking for boyfriends, some of you single guys. And stop expecting your wife or your husband to solve you. They can't and they won't. They won't do it. Only Jesus can do that. There's only one place you can go for life, not your spouse. I talk like an expert. Well, I'm an expert because I know exactly what not to do. And I'm slowly learning what to do. And I can tell you right now that going to your wife for your comfort, going to your wife for, for your ego, going to your wife for your satisfaction, going to your wife to try to get life out of her will do one thing and one thing only. It'll empty her. And she'll be a shell. And you'll be mad all the time. You know why? Because she's a lousy God. And she won't deliver satisfaction sometimes. She won't deliver comfort sometimes. She won't protect you sometimes. And it works the other way as well, right? And then you go, well, you didn't deliver. You weren't there when I needed you. Well, she can't be. She's a human being. And human beings, they're not God. If you learn to go to him, serve the Lord thy God. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Strength. Put him first. Run away from idols. If you go to him, your wife's an idol. You run to him. He has endless protection, endless satisfaction, endless love, endless comfort. And if you discover him the way that little boy did that talked to me, knows Jesus personally. If you discover him and you run to him, you now are filled and you overflow into your wife. Man, I wish I knew that before. Anything you run to other than God is an idol. Anything you run to other than God for comfort, for strength, for healing, for salvation, it will not work. It will destroy you and you will perish. 
You will be depressed. You will be brokenhearted to the day you die. You will be empty. And you will have little fleeting moments where you find, oh, I really like painting. Oh, somebody really liked my painting. They bought my painting for a million dollars. I feel good. Now I got to have another painting because I don't feel good anymore. Anything other than God will go blip, 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 blip. If I could only marry her and I married her. Oh, if I could only become a preacher. No, oh. anything other than Jesus will give you a temporary little lie and then go back down into the pit and probably further down. Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, our Savior, our God, our friend, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, is the answer. And I don't care. You don't have to accept that. I think most people here, or all people here, do accept that. It's not about religion. It's about Jesus. When we are lonely, we run, we run to websites, chat sites, Netflix, TV. When we are stressed, we run to smokes, vaping, comedy. When we are in pain, we run to alcohol or the church or other people. What do you run to other than God? Ask yourself that question. What do you run to other than God? We all do it. All of us. It's an idol. Get rid of it. It will lead you to death. Get rid of it. What do you run to other than God? Or who do you run to? As a pastor, this happens. I get some people that think that I'm the guy. Because I can sit and talk about your heart and about your feelings and about some of the pain in your life. And they feel comfort. They get this temporary comfort. And then all of a sudden I'm getting texts at 2 in the morning, at 3 in the morning, at 10 in the morning, at 8 in the morning. Because they can't get enough of me. They need more of me. And you know what that does to me? It empties me. It drains me. I can't do it. I'm not Jesus. I am not Jesus. I am not Jesus. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm not Jesus. I have Jesus in me. He is transforming me. He is giving me everything I need, and I want you to have him. I want you to get everything you need from him. What do you run to other than God? Numbing yourself makes you feel better temporarily, but it soon eats you up and destroys you and everyone around you. Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. That was me for 20, 25 years. 25 years. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink. Galatians 5, 19 and 23. Listen to this. It's long, but listen. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery as drugs. Idolatry is what we're talking about. Worshiping anything other than God. Hostility, anger, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Most people interpret that, that if you live that sort of life, you're not going to heaven. Let me clarify this. You will not inherit that kingdom of God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is it in heaven? God calls all the shots. Nobody ever disagrees with him. He calls all the shots. And his shots are always best for his children. We want that on earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things shall be added unto you seek ye first the kingdom of god we are saved by faith we're saved by faith the just shall live by faith we're saved by faith but if you don't inherit the kingdom of god you will not have joy you will not have peace you will not have the fruit of the spirit life self-control peace security so if you choose to keep living this way you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. Don't, isn't that what we want? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You must run to Jesus to get that. You must know him. You must seek him. You must run to Jesus. When you've got a broken heart, run to Jesus. Point number three, do not hide. I cry out to the Lord. I plead the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him, and I tell him all my troubles. David is not hiding. I'm not sure. The psalmist is not hiding. I'm not positive David wrote that. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. There is only one place to run when you're broken. It's Jesus. The problem is not your town or your church or your job or your spouse. The problem is in your heart, not your environment. The problem is in your heart. How can you run away? I used to play Yellowknife lots. Yellowknife is full of guys that got out of jail because they got out of jail and their reputation is hard and they, they need a new environment and they're running away and they run to Yellowknife and, and, and they're all in Yellowknife because it's where do you run to? Yellowknife is the end of the world you know you can go to Anuvik but I don't recommend it you can't run it's like there's a song by Jimi Hendrix that you know he's going to go way down to Mexico he kills his girlfriend he's going to go way down to Mexico so that he doesn't get hung you can't run you, God knows you are carrying your baggage with you. You're carrying your heart problem with you. You can't run. Your heart's inside of you. You run, it's inside of you. And you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it. The problem, I get this too. You know, people come from other churches and they come to our church and I'm happy to have them. But the first thing I got to ask them is, what, why are you here? Why did you leave your other church? Because I can guarantee you in two or three months or six months, it's going to show up again and now you're going to hate me. Because it's in your heart. We need to deal with our heart. There's only one place to run and that's straight to Jesus. He's the doctor. You want to deal with your heart, you got to go to the doctor. The problem is not your town or your church or your job or your spouse. It's in your heart. New location won't help. Suicide will not help. Suicide will not help. We think, oh, if I kill myself, this pain will be gone. Oh, no, no, no. You, your life lives on, folks. Yes. Your life lives on. You're not running. You got to deal with this. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, I'm not here to say that, oh, you commit suicide, you're going to hell. The Bible doesn't say that. No. But I got to tell you, it's big evidence that you don't know Jesus. So I'm worried. Suicide worries me because if you know Jesus, he's going to protect you from that stupid decision, selfish decision, thinking that you're going to, to solve your problems by that. You're just destroying everybody around you and you're destroying yourself and God lives beyond your heartbeat, folks. And I am telling you right now, the blood of Jesus is, is enough for all of us. Thank God. Hallelujah. But don't run from your pain. Deal with your pain. Don't run from your broken heart. Deal with your broken heart. Don't numb your broken heart. Deal with your broken heart. Deal with it. You don't need a new location. You need a new heart. And I will give you... A new heart, Ezekiel says, and I will put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. You need a new heart. Do not run. Do not run. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. There is only one place to run when you are broken, and that's Jesus. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. If you run to booze and drugs, if you run to church and religion, if you run to self-righteousness and, and, and lies, if you run to, to money and fame, it'll eat you up. It will destroy you. If you run to Jesus, there are people in this church that have run to Jesus and we've watched them and they have peace even when there has been horrific circumstances in their life. And I won't name names. There are people in this church that have run to Jesus instead of idols 
and they have peace in their life that you can see. They have joy, they have life, even though they have lived through horrific circumstances. That should be all the truth you need. It should be all the proof you need. Jesus is the doctor. Suicide won't help. Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. And God, rescue anybody that's even considering that. Rescue them, please, Lord. Yes, amen. Like you did us. Yes. We've all been there. When your heart is broken, you need a new heart. Only Jesus can give you a new heart. And I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. And I'll take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Last point. Do not strike back. It's not fun to be betrayed. It's not fun to have people sin against you. It's not fun to hear hurtful comments behind your back that aren't true. It's not even fun to hear hurtful comments behind your back that are true. Because that doesn't, that's not love. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I see this in you, and oh, I love you, and you know, what can I do to help? But if you're hearing it, even if it is true, if it's not true, it hurts even more. It's not fun to have, when you're, we've got Winnie's sisters here. I bet you guys have fights lots. Because when you live together and you're together, it's like you, you, you gotta, you know, who, who left the, the cap off the toothpaste, you know, and who used my makeup, and, you know, I get the car tonight, and, you, you know, the closer you are, the more friction there is. And I, I'm so happy that you're my family, and we're close, and it's worth it. It's worth it. It is worth being close. I don't, I don't want this shallow church. See you next Sunday. Everything's great. No, I want a church where we rub close. And that's going to cause some pain. And we're going to have to forgive each other. And we're going to have to, we're going to, have to decide. You know, are we going to, are we going to do what Jesus would do? Or are we going to just get mad and pay back evil for evil? And I, am I going to run and, and go away? I'm not going to ever see you again. I'm not visiting you anymore. Am I, am I going to talk behind your back? Strike back. Manipulate people to hate you too. We all do it. I'm not pointing fingers. We all do it. We, this is not going to solve our broken heart. It's going to add to your broken heart. It hurts. We're hurt. And getting mad and getting even is God's job, not our job. So the other day, somebody's mad at me. And it's over an apartment rental you know somebody has got problems and can't pay their rent and it's tough when you're a pastor you know what i had to put an eviction notice on the door hasn't paid for two and a half months i had to put an eviction notice on the door and morgan's car mysteriously got her you know back window knocked out you know with a hammer the next day i don't know hey first of all i don't know uh, god knows though so the first thing we do is we we pray God, you know who it is. Will you please forgive them, first of all? And Lord, it, it, vengeance is yours. And if they need to be disciplined, please discipline them. And mo mo mostly, please protect us because we don't want anything more to happen. We put it in God's hands. Don't repay evil for evil. 1 Peter 3, 9 and 11. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Didn't we do this last week? We talked Jesus understands. Did you see the way he handled it? Oh. People mocking him, spitting on him. He's God. He's the creator of the universe. He's going to wipe them out? That song says he could have called 10,000 angels. He, he remains silent. You got nothing good to say? Don't say anything. Silent. <clears throat> he, he made it clear. Pilate's going, hey, don't you know I have the authority to kill you? He said, if, if I didn't give you the authority, you wouldn't have the authority. I gave you the authority for my glory. Because I need this to happen. I need to die for Carson, and Cheryl Lynn, and Les. I need to do this. Amen. And I'm using you to do it. Amen. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. This is Jesus. This is who we are supposed to become. We need to do this.
Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. I had some Wiccans, witches uh, a couple years ago say, you know, there's 15 of us and we're all cursing you. And I said, well, you know what? I am praying that God will bless you. Amen. They looked at me like, what? I am praying that God will bless you. And I will tell you, I've gotten to know a couple of them a little bit more. And I love them. And you know what? They're starting to know me. And we're starting to love each other. I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want them to go to hell. They've been deceived. They, 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 there is power in demons. There is power. It's real. You know, I got a, I got a friend that goes to sweats and he sees things move and he sees people quivering on the ground. And I mean, this is real stuff. You can go to a psychic and he can tell you exactly what your dead dad said to you when you were four years old and no one else heard it. Yeah, absolutely. The demon was there. They, are, they know. They want to earn your trust because why? They want to kill you. They want to separate you from God. They want to depress you. They want to destroy you. And they will. They will. If you trust them, they will. If you trust God, he'll cream them. He'll rule. He'll release them from your life. He'll give you joy, peace, self-control, purpose. It's so great. We quite a few. I recommend you guys. They go to continuing care, and and you got a 99 year old going. I can't wait to get up this morning. I have a job to do, and I hope that's you. I hope that's you because it's God's purpose right to your last breath. Why did my dad stay alive for four days in a coma? What purpose is that? I got to tell you, I've seen God working in my life. While well, dad's lying there in a coma and God's speaking to me about some things in my heart that have to change. And I know he did that with my brothers and grandchildren and other people in the church. There's a purpose for every breath you take. Doesn't matter. There is a purpose for your life. Don't cut it short. Don't ever choose to cut it short. Your suffering is the greatest gift God can give you. Don't cut it short. Pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And he will grant you his blessing. He's going he's gonna to bless you. And he's the one that will give you the power to do that. It won't come from you. It will come from him. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life. How many people here want to enjoy life? Okay. If you want to enjoy life, make lots of money and get a swimming pool. No. If you want to enjoy life, get really famous and be in a rock band. No. If you want to enjoy life, get to be the number one grand poobah in your church. No, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Hard to do when the back of the window gets smashed out and $700 bill. But what good is it going to be to go smash their window out? What, what is that going to do? Or to go around and you know, these are people that are hurt. These people have broken hearts. These people don't know Jesus or probably don't know Jesus. I can't even say that for sure. They are reacting and they're probably reacting in an inebriated state. And I love them. God loves them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And bless them. Oh God, bless them. Please save them. Please don't punish them. Oh God, please don't punish them. Please, rather than that, wrap your arms around them. Introduce yourself to them. That's what I want. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. Jesus' example. Father, forgive them. He understands. Some people here, and I have been, are mad at God. Do you want to know something about God? He's okay with it. You know how come I know that? Read the Psalms. Unbelievable. He, I, you can't say that to God. Oh, it's in the Bible. The Holy Spirit wrote that. Well, I guess you can say that. He wants sincerity. He doesn't want a fake smile. He doesn't want you to give religious words when it's time to pray. He wants you to tell the truth. 
He wants you to tell the truth. And if you're mad at him, put it out on the table. Put it out on the table. Tell him exactly. I can tell you that he will bring you peace. You draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. He will bring you peace. He'll even give you a gift of showing you why that pain happened or why that, that, that health problem happened or why that financial problem happened or why he took your spouse from you. He'll even give you a glimpse of what he's up to if you cry out to him. And when you die, one second after you die, you're going to go, oh, thank you, God, for that pain. Oh, thank you, Lord, for what you did for me when you ripped my house from me. When you made me bankrupt, when you took that job from me, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you made me live another five years after my wife died. That was valuable time, God, thank you. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. It's okay to be mad at God. But if you trust him, listen, he'll talk to you. He'll tell you what's going on and you won't regret it. James 1.10, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's a time to be righteously angered, but if you're angry because you're hurt, this is a sin. If you're angry because you're hurt, this is a sin. Where would we be if Jesus got angry every time we hurt him? We'd be toast a million times over. Joseph betrayed his brothers. I'm getting to the end. Jealous and murderous. His brothers were unbelievable, right? That was a dysfunctional family. They took their younger brother, who they were jealous about. He had the coat of many colors. His dad was spoiling him. And he says, you know what? I had a vision. You guys are all going to bow down and worship me someday. And they go, oh, yeah? Throw him into the pit. Let's kill him. One brother stands up and says, no, let's not kill him. How about we sell him to this Egyptian tribe? Sells him to the Egyptian tribe. The, the, the peddlers, right? The convoy. He goes into Egypt and he gets bought on a slave stand for Potiphar to work for Potiphar. He's so good at what he does because he's honest. He finds $40 on the floor and he goes, Potiphar, I found $40 on the floor. Potiphar's so impressed by him that he puts him in charge of everything. And then Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of rape because he wouldn't sleep with her. Straight up. He wouldn't sleep with her, so she accuses him of rape. Boom, back into prison. Potiphar knew. He just didn't like the fact that his wife liked Joseph and not him. So he puts him into prison. What does he do in prison? He becomes the guy in prison. The guy that's bringing light to all the prisoners. The guy that's bringing joy to all this miserable place that he's in. And he answers their questions about their dreams. And then those guys get out. The baker. Who was the other guy? Wine glass. Wine glass taster guy. I don't know. That was because of poison. I'm not sure. But one of them got hung. One of them. The, the prophecies came true. And then the Pharaoh has a dream. And he goes, hey, I know a guy that can interpret your dream. Joseph comes up there and ends up being second in charge of all of Egypt, the most powerful country in the world at the time. Second in charge, right after the Pharaoh. And what happens? His brothers are starving. And they go into Egypt. And they got to face their brother. And they bowed to him. They bowed to him. Just like God told them would happen. But here's the key that changed me. It hit me hard while my dad was in a coma. It hit me hard. You see, if I could get a bit personal, this you can maybe think about your own life. My children rescued their mother from a drunk, abusive, drug addict, bitter, angry father. They rescued their mother from me. I've never had bad feelings to my ex-wife because I don't think she should have lasted that long. She should have left me a long time ago. But there was something still inside of me that was mad at my kids that I didn't know about. Because my kids had the whole plan figured out, how to get a police protection order, 
come home and get me out. And I haven't talked to them in any way, shape or form significantly in eight years. But deep down inside, something is like, see, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In your life, the pain, the, the heartbreak, you might think it's for evil, but it's not. It's for good. It's made you who you are. The hurts that you're enduring has made you a different person. And he has a reason for that. Some of the trauma that some of you have had, I can't even think what it would be like to be raised like that. Some of you have been raised with pure abuse, some incest. Some of you are culprits of sin on the other side, like me. And I have to nail that to the cross. That too has made me who I am. If I surrender that to Christ, it has made me who I am for what? For his glory? What is glory? His love, his reverence, his holiness, his perfectness. Why? Because my father who is perfect wants to give me life, eternal life. And he has allowed all of those hurts and brokenness for my greater good. They meant it for evil, but he meant it for good. If Joseph would have turned around and says, okay, I got you guys now, you're going to pay. I don't believe the gospel would have ever infiltrated the Israelites. At that time, there was only 70 Israelites, around 70. And this miracle that God did through Joseph's pain, through his brokenheartedness, through the betrayal, through the gossip, through the murderous behavior of his brothers, turned into the salvation of his people and the salvation of Egypt. You have gone through this for the salvation of others. You have gone through what you've gone through for the salvation of your people. You have gone through what you're gone through to introduce people to Jesus, the one and only true cure for a broken heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for all of our brokenness. Thank you that we know that you are the doctor and God wrap your arm around anybody here that has a broken heart. God, we know that you understand and we know that we can't numb it. We can't run away from it. We can't attack others pay evil for evil. God, we know that we need to face it. And it won't be easy facing it. And it'll take longer than a bottle of booze. But God, I pray that you will give everyone the faith to put their brokenness on the table today, on the altar, and that they will face it. And if it takes two or three years or six years or the rest of their life, they won't run from it. They won't try to solve it themselves. They won't try to punish others. They won't try to numb it, but they will deal with their broken heart. And that they will deal with it with you. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you once again for hanging on to us, even when we don't hang on to you. In your name, amen.